Okay, so nobody out there really believes that the History Channel's hit series Vikings is all that historically accurate. But you might be surprised just how many liberties the show takes with the truth. Here are some of the biggest inaccuracies and mistruths you'll find in Vikings. In Season 1, Vikings introduces Ragnar Lothbrok and his brother Rollo, and they're kind of a big deal as far as the show goes. Both were historical figures, too, though Ragnar himself was more of a mythic King Arthur-style figure, while Rollo was more firmly grounded in actual historical record. But one thing is for sure, they definitely weren't brothers. Rollo was born in Scandinavia somewhere around 845 AD, and he lived until around 930. It's true that he was a Viking, and it's also true that he participated in raids in the Kingdom of West Francia and eventually became the first ruler of Normandy. But he was almost certainly not related to Ragnar Lothbrok, and it's unlikely the two ever even met. Ragnar, if indeed a real person, probably lived from around 820 to 865, which means he's at least 25 years Rollo senior, so would have been approaching the end of his life just as Rollo was entering adulthood. So why does the show commit this particular historical error? Well, both men are fascinating figures, and it's easier for a television audience to invest in two divergent storylines if they're introduced at first as two parts of the same storyline. In one of its earliest episodes, the show demonstrates the total brutality of the Viking raiders by depicting an attack on a monastery at Lindisfarne, just off the coast of Northumbria. During the raid, Rollo kills an elderly Christian monk named Cuthbert, who was the mentor to many of the monks at the monastery. This actual raid happened at Lindisfarne in 793 and it really was as horrific as the series makes it out to be. Gold and silver was plundered, many monks perished, and some of the younger ones were abducted as slaves, which is basically what happens in Athelstan's storyline. But the major problem with the event as depicted is that the real Cuthbert didn't meet such a grisly end. In fact, he died of natural causes in 687, more than 100 years before the raid in Linden's farm. The real-life Cuthbert, who was canonized after his death, was what's known as an incorrupt saint, which essentially means that his remains didn't decompose naturally after he died. His body and relics attracted pilgrims to the shrine of St. Cuthbert in Lindensfarne long before the Vikings ever showed up. And unlike the fictional version of Cuthbert, the real canonized version of Cuthbert actually survived the Viking raid. His body was moved, and after the Norman conquest, ended up in a shrine at Durham Cathedral, where it continued to attract pilgrims throughout the Middle Ages. One of the most egregious liberties the series takes is the idea that Ragnar Lothbrok discovered the British Isles. This little detail has peeved many a historian, including the University of Wisconsin's Eve Siebert, who writes for Skeptic.com, England, stop acting as if you're sailing for friggin' Atlantis. It's England. Everyone knows it's there. A good portion of Western Europe's invaded it already. The truth is that England was not some mystical land located far across the sea. There was trade going on between Scandinavians and Europeans long before the Viking Age. And one popular hypothesis among historians is that the Viking Age actually began at least in part because Scandinavian traders felt like they were being discriminated against by Christian Europeans. For that matter, the raid on Lindensfarne wasn't even the first Viking raid in Great Britain. Accounts exist of Norse attacks on Wessex and Kent for at least five years prior to 793. But hey, the treatment of the discovery of England does make Ragnar seem even more legendary, so it's at least effective as far as what showrunners were trying to accomplish. Anytime two cultures clash, there's bound to be a little awkwardness. Vikings handles that awkwardness well, too. During scenes in which Norsemen and Anglo-Saxons interact, the language barrier is depicted by having the characters speak to each other in subtitled Old Norse or Old English, which provides a kind of authenticity that is often lacking in other shows and movies. But one bigger language problem the show has sticks out at the very first glance. Nobody would have ever called someone else a Viking. For the most part, the show's Anglo-Saxon characters use terms like Northmen to describe Ragnar and his folk, but there are also scenes where the Vikings call each other Viking. Because we are Vikings. <laughs> but the Norse word Vikinger was used to describe a specific person who went on an adventure or expedition overseas, and the word Viking was used to describe the activity itself. Neither word was used for an ethnic group, just as you wouldn't use road trippers synonymous for American. It wasn't until the 14th and 15th centuries that the word Viking was applied to the Norse as a group. One thing you gotta give Vikings is that everybody looks pretty great, so thumbs up to the costume designers for making everyone look badass, and thumbs down to the costume designers too for making those Vikings look nothing like the real deal. Sadly, the Vikings didn't wear fitted leather tunics studded with metal. Leather garments would have been worn loose, which was more practical, if far less cool. On top of that, the series tends to make its Vikings much more drab than they would have been. Rather than the faded browns and grays you'll find on the show, the real Vikings almost certainly wore colorful clothes, including red, yellow, blue, and purple, and they likely wore patterned clothing as well. 
Men wore long tunics and trousers made from linen or wool, and wool leg wrappings to help them stay warm during the harsh winters. Women, meanwhile, wore linen underdresses under a garment called a strap dress, and they would have likely worn them in various colors as well. So yeah, dark and broody might look cool, but the truth is those Norsemen looked pretty darn fly. In the series, the Vikings have some crazy elaborate hairstyles, including cool braids, partially shaved heads, and long beards. All very manly and punk rock for sure, which is clearly the look the show is going for, but is it accurate? Not really. For a start, Vikings probably didn't shave the sides of their heads. Anyone will tell you it can get pretty cold in Scandinavia, and deliberately exposing most of your head to those freezing temperatures seems like a bad idea, even for someone who's taken one too many axe blows to the head. Series creator Michael Hurst does think the Vikings might have shaved their heads to keep lice at bay, though obviously that would only really make sense if they were shaving their entire heads. The Bayou Tapestry also suggests that 11th century Norman warriors shaved the back of their head, but it's debatable whether their Viking ancestors would have necessarily done the same 200 years earlier. Other contemporary sources suggest this hairstyle could have Danish origins, but it's definitely no sure thing. So did they wear those super elaborate braids? There doesn't seem to be much evidence for that either, but who says they didn't? As Hearst himself once said, in the end, how the f do you know what the Vikings look like? The Anglo-Saxon monk Athelstan is one of the series' most interesting characters. He serves the dual purpose of providing a window into the culture of ancient Britain, as well as providing viewers some of the show's most heart-wrenching moments. We will never meet again, my friend. But I have a feeling that your God might object to me visiting you in heaven. But alas, such a friendship probably never happened, as there is no record of a monk-turned-Viking in the historical saga of Ragnar Lothbrok. Since the character is fictional, it's also pretty much a dead cert that he wasn't the secret father of Alfred the Great. The most objectionable treatment of Athelstan's character, though, is his crucifixion by Christians in the episode An Eye for an Eye. By some accounts, crucifixion probably ended in the 4th century, but if anyone was still doing it in Viking times, it sure as heck wasn't the Christians. In fact, historians say there aren't any examples of Christian crucifixion in the historical record, and that Christians of that time would have actually viewed crucifixion as something holy, reserved only for Jesus and not some random lawbreakers. Unless you've got some serious issues to work through, you probably found the show's blood eagle scenes at least a little disturbing. This horrific Viking method of execution saw the victim have the skin on his back pulled away, his ribs hacked apart until they can be yanked up past his spine, and his lungs ripped out and placed on his back so that they will flutter bird-like as he dies. <sighs> At some point, salt water is also poured into his wound. Basically, it's not a lot of fun. So did this horribly brutal form of execution actually exist? Well, until recently, historians mostly agreed that the Blood Eagle was real, if only because no later medieval writer could possibly dream up such a horrific thing. But most accounts either come directly out of the Norse and Icelandic sagas, which were almost certainly embellished, or from texts written hundreds of years after these events supposedly occurred. And the fact that descriptions of the Blood Eagle get more and more brutal and detailed as the centuries pass is further evidence that the ritual either didn't exist or has been greatly distorted through time. Although Vikings is undoubtedly a pretty show, it does take some liberties with the locations in which it's set. Take the Temple to Odin at Uppsala, for example, which the show depicts as existing in a beautiful mountain setting. The actual Temple of Uppsala was in Sweden, on a rather flat-looking grassy plain. The only hills of any kind are three burial mounds, which are thought to be the final resting places of three Norse kings. Then there's Ragnar's home. It's also worth mentioning that Kattegat, the show's central location, never existed, and Ragnar Lothbrok, if he did indeed exist, was probably from Denmark, or perhaps Sweden. The geography of the show looks distinctively Norwegian, however. All in all, the mountainous, snowy wonderland that Ragnar and his family inhabit may be beautiful, but it's not really accurate in any way. It serves a purpose, though. Showrunners want viewers to think of the Vikings as surviving in a wild, inhospitable landscape. In the end, the setting isn't supposed to be realistic. It's supposed to support the trajectory of the show. Longtime fans of the show might have noticed that, despite taking place over many years, characters such as Ragnar and Ligurtha tend to age pretty slowly, or pretty well at least. But time moves strangely in Vikings, as anyone who's tried to decipher the show's bizarre timeline will tell you. The raid on the monastery at Lindisfarne happens pretty early in the series, and that real-life event happened in 793. Then, in Season 3, events jump forward in time to the raid on Paris in 845, which was more than half a century after Lindisfarne, 
Okay, so maybe an elderly Ragnar could have pulled that off, especially when you take into account the weirdly slow rate at which he ages. But then, early in Season 4, the Vikings raid Paris again, a raid which happened between the years 885 and 886, nearly a whole century after the raid on Lindisfarne. And Ragnar definitely isn't 100 years old at that point. Things aren't made much easier by the fact that the Great Heathen Army, which is the center point of Season 4's final episodes, invaded England in 865, which is 20 years before the Paris Raid depicted earlier that season. Confused? Who can blame you? Just chalk it up to creative license, sit back, and try to enjoy the violence. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.